Thank you, Sujan Park, for coming on Mondays of the Town. We really appreciate it. Of course. Um, so you're probably best known for being a correspondent from TV News. Yes. Can you tell me what was the best part of that job? Oh, boy. Um, the best part uh, about working with MTV and MTV News has to be the fact that for you know over 10 plus years, um, I got to cover stories from Britney Spears' meltdowns to presidential elections to amazing, important social campaigns. You know, um, it was such, a, such an amazing mix of stories all the time that um, I didn't ever have to deny any curiosity that I had, whether it was pop culture, whether it was youth culture, whether it was politics. It was one of those jobs that let you sort of do all of it, and it's been pretty hard to follow that. Um, how's it going, though? You've moved on to an online um, site where you're yes. the chief correspondent. Yeah. Um, how is that you know, different? How is that the same? Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm now the chief correspondent for DailyCandy.com, which is, um, like you said, an online um, company, but they're owned by NBC, so it's also part of a large um, media network as well. Um, how is it different? I mean, in a way, it's not really different at all. You know, um, the work is pretty much still the same. You know, I still research stories, I still um, do interviews, um, I still do, I film all that stuff. It just so happens that uh, the majority of that is online. And then a lot of what I do is sort of um, speak about um, women's issues and um, beauty regimens or tips and that sort of thing on um, national television shows like the Today Show or E! or that sort of thing. So in a lot of ways my job is um, similar, but it's different in the sense that, um, you know, today I don't work for just one media company. You know, whereas with MTV, I was there, you know, nine to nine, you know, every day for years. That was really sort of um, my focus. But every day looks different now. Sometimes I'm working on Daily Candy. Sometimes I'm working on, you know, whether it's coming to a campus and giving a speech or whether I'm working on um, my business. I own a business now as well. So um, it's different in the sense that... Um, no two days are alike, and I'm not quite sure who I'm working for on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's how I prefer it. Um, you were recently part of a PBS documentary called Makers, Women in America. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what it was like to be part of it? Um, I mean, you know, when somebody, when AOL approaches you in partnership with PBS and says, listen, we're doing this documentary about female pioneers, you don't really say no to that. You sort of go, me? Um, but you don't say no. And I had no idea that it was going to be as big as it was. Um, I didn't know who the other makers were going to be. Um, this was really sort of early on in the process. And I never like to think about where it all ends up. I just sort of focus on, you know, the, the day at hand, the task at hand, the question at hand. So having a conversation about, you know, my life and as a female, as an immigrant, as an Asian American, about my career, my personal life, I mean, it was amazing. And I, you know, I don't do a lot of that. You know, I'm usually on the other side asking questions. So whenever I see it, the Makers documentary um, or the online um, segment that I did, I'm like sort of cringing because it's just me and I'm like, oh, God, talk with my hands or like I'm making such weird faces. I'm sure I'm doing that now. Um, I'm so used to being on the other side of the camera. So, um, but that's selfishly speaking. On the whole, I think it's an amazing, amazing time to be a woman. I think it's an amazing time to be um, to be having this conversation. You know, whether you're talking about you know CEOs of tech companies or you're talking about a mompreneur or you're talking about a young female college grad. These are all kind of conversations that we're all having um, and it's not just women having these conversations but it's really a national and global conversations about where we as women are and the workplace and at home and, and how that has changed today. So I don't know, it was such a, it was, 
you never, I mean, it's so rare that you get to do something for work that is so personally rewarding. So to see something like that exist and to be a part of it is like, it's like a comet, you know? It's like, it's brilliant, you don't know when it's gonna come again, but you just, so you just have to be a part of it. We've also started um, an entrepreneurial fair yes. in New York called yeah. the Herber Street Fair. Hester Street Hester Fair. Street Fair, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> um, can you tell us some more about that and you know what it took to start that, where it's going? Yeah, you know how like you sit around with friends and you have this like kooky idea, you're like, oh let's make litter boxes or I don't know, I wanna make cell phone covers and it never happens or when it does, it's like kind of a joke. Well, so my friends and I, I, I'm obsessed with flea markets and with local markets and farmers markets. And I, we thought it'd be kind of fun to put something together. I had no idea that this was going to be a business. I had no idea how much work it was going to take. I had no idea how much I was going to love it. But basically, the Hester Street Fair is an outdoor um, market in New York City on the Lower East Side. So if you're there, you should definitely go. It's every Saturday and we have a rotating group of 65 vendors um, from thousands of vendors that come and then they sort of get whittled down and curated to 65 and they change every week. And it's everything from amazing food entrepreneurs to jewelry makers to vintage collectors. Um, it's really become a launching pad for entrepreneurs. We have a lot of um, small businesses that have never sold before and they just start at Hester Street Fair and then go on to open up their own restaurants or their own brick and mortar shops which has been really exciting. So I don't know, I started out this idea that I had all these friends that were sort of half employed in New York City that were doing like really amazing stuff whether they were making jewelry or terrariums or baking macaroons and I thought okay well why don't we just have a place where you sell your stuff I mean maybe you can get some extra cash on the side and it'll be fun. Um, but I had no idea that there was such a hunger for this um, in the consumer side of it, and then there was such a hunger for it, certainly, um, as a business person. So I own a business that essentially just helps other small businesses do well, and that is, uh, it's just been such a passion project, and it's certainly, uh, strangely, what led me to Daily Candy, because Daily Candy knew of Hester Street Fair and thought, oh, well, you curate this market, could you curate our site and the content. So it kind of strangely all came together. Um, so it's been really, really incredible. Um, so where do you see it growing or changing or where, will it, where do you think it'll go in the future? Gee, I don't know. I mean, I'd, it'd be great if we could see a Hester Street Fair in every city. Um, that would be amazing. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I had no expectations going into it. So I, I have no idea where it's going to go. And that's sort of so beautiful about it because um, it just is its own thing. Um, for me, the most important thing is, it, whether it's in my work as a journalist or whether it's in my work with Hester Street Fair as an entrepreneur, what I love and what I'm passionate about is giving other people platforms to do what they love. And whether it's interviewing a young person about their passion about volunteering or about their passion about politics or their passion about music, or whether it's giving an entrepreneur uh, a break you know, to sell something that they love making. It's all kind of the same to me. you know. Um, so I just want to continue doing this, is giving other people platforms to do what they love to do. That's, that's, like, that's what I really enjoy about my job. Um, it isn't necessarily you know, being in front of the camera or, you know, um, meeting celebrities or not celebrities. It's really at the end of the day is how do I serve as a way for other people to be able to fulfill their own passions and be creative and express themselves. So to be able to continue to do that would be amazing. And whether that's on camera, whether that's off camera, it doesn't matter to me. Very cool. Um, can you tell me about your speech tonight and you know a little bit of what you're going to be talking about? <clears throat> well, um, the speaker before me was a clown doctor. Um, I don't know if you know that, but uh, it's pretty awesome. So it's going to be a tough act to follow. Um, some folks from the Great Issues community asked if um, this was what I was wearing, not a clown suit. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, in all seriousness, what am I going to talk about? I mean, you know, I'm just going to talk about, <clears throat> I think, my career and my life, which hopefully sheds 
some sort of light on diversity, whether it's in a community, whether it's in the media, whether it's in our daily lives or, you know, in a bigger scale. And um, I hope to have a really interesting conversation with the student body here about where they see diversity in their lives, you know, um, whether they see more of it, whether they see less of it, um, where they find it lacking, and try to hopefully come to have an interesting conversation about it, but maybe even some answers in the room. I don't doubt the student body of, I mean, I can already tell from the small interaction I've had with the students here that it's going to be um, a very intelligent conversation. So for me, um, you know, I always look at these, I don't do these very often, and I don't come to many campuses, but when I do, it's my chance to actually get to interact with um, college students about their everyday lives, rather than somebody hand me a research paper about it. So I always tell people I kind of feel like in a lot of ways, I've been faking it until I come and actually talk to a student body. So, I don't know, SLU will also be a really great learning place for me as well. I hope we can do that. Um, <laughs> so, the conversation about diversity, yep. um, where do you currently you know, see it heading and mm -hmm. do you think it's, where do you think it might be you know, lacking or needing? Um, <clears throat> I think where it's lacking and um, will be always trying to make inroads in creating more diversity in positions of power, right? So your directors, your CEOs, your producers, your writers. But in the end, I think that the real power comes from um, the bottom up because of technology. And, you know, I'm, it's not a secret that young people from their keyboards all around the world are toppling dictatorships and changing the world as, as we know it. Um, and I don't know if every generation feels that way, like this is the gener this is the revolution, here we are, and this is the generation of change. I never really believed that until now, you know, because I now see it with my own eyes. That through technology and through the use of technology and the ease of technology and the affordability of technology, that young people are their own news programmers, they're their own radio programmers, they are their own directors. That you don't need necessarily big institutions to validate the work or your voice. So that's really exciting um, because young people embrace diversity in a way that our parents and our grandparents' generation never did or defined it in a way. Um, so, I mean, racism still exists, absolutely. Sexism still exists. All those, um, all those conditions still exist, but I think the solutions are much more readily available, and I think that we're all much more enlightened as a community of young people for it. So hopefully this generation is going to be the generation of change, and when it comes to diversity, to embrace diversity in a way that has never been embraced before, truly embraced, not just by marches and civil rights movements, which were super important, but I'm talking about the everyday work and the everyday choices that we make, that we embrace diversity in our DNA. Cool. So if the students that come to your speech take one thing out of it, yeah. what do you hope that is? The students um, take... I hope that the students... I hope that the students feel really empowered, you know? I think, and I don't know, I mean, maybe it's different now. You know, this generation is a lot more confident, maybe. At least that's what the studies say. <laughs> it's the truth. I have been told. Um, but I hope that they leave with the sense that to be, that they have to know that they are empowered to make decisions in their lives that will not only better themselves, but everybody else around them. And you don't have to be standing in front of a podium to say that, that you can do it just from the privacy of your dorm room or the community of um, college campus students. So I hope that they feel really empowered. Um, I hope that they feel like change is something that they all can engage in. And um, at the end of the day, if that is what I can impart, then um, I would be 100% thrilled. Is there anything else you think I should have asked you about? <laughs> no, I think okay. you covered it all. <laughs> Good. Thank well, you. Thank you very much.